Tonight's a little different in that I kind of want to take a little bit of an under the oaks without the tables, but still a little bit more of that posture. And uh, the reason we decided to do this, or the Spirit led us to do this, was I was walking on the beach, which is kind of my MO for, for every day that it's possible. Um, that's, that, that's the place I hear the most effectively from the Lord, either the ranch in Texas or the beach here are the two places that I just really have a lot of history with the Lord. And as I was walking, I felt the Lord call me to revisit a text that I've ministered from, probably not exaggerating to say a hundred times over the years. Um, but I began to see it differently on that walk. And I felt like the Lord said, gather leaders and share this. I didn't really have a strategy, but I went back to Tammy who, who doesn't walk with me on the beach. She sits on the beach and reads and reads and reads and catches up on all of her reading and then reads some more and um, then turns and reads like this so her back's to the sun to make sure you got to get both sides even you know so anyway um so we uh so i went back to her and shared it and she began to help me formulate this idea that what if we turned a reunion weekend kind of into a hybrid under the oaks and so that's kind of what we're doing, not just by having a Q&A. And, and please, if you've not been a part of one of the Q&As, don't, let, don't check out because you hear Q&A. They're not like most normal Q&As. We have a move of the Spirit. It doesn't matter if we're eating popsicles. We have a move of the Spirit. So that's just what revival culture looks like. So it's, it's, it's really a, a, an important gathering. But also to take tonight and even kind of pull back on some of the things I'm being led to teach within our local culture about the Lordship of the Holy Spirit. We are certainly reaping the benefit of that tonight. I felt the red carpet rolled out for Holy Spirit tonight, and it was just a different thing right from Jump Street. I hope the worship team felt the ease of that and ability to just move right in. But I, I, I so I'm saying that to say I'm going to take a little bit more of a... a reading some of my writings approach to what we're doing tonight. We'll, we're going to take our time. It's not even eight o'clock yet, 752, according to that clock back there. And so we're going to take our time tonight and kind of walk through some things, but I am going to be unapologetic in that I'm speaking to leaders. Now, when I say leader, I don't necessarily mean your own staff at a church somewhere. I think a lot of those people are not leaders. A lot of those people are hirelings. And then there's a lot of people who are not on staff somewhere that are actually leaders because they're actually leading things. And so I'm, I, want, I want to just help some leaders to understand kind of what process we're in. That some of this may seem somewhat irrelevant to those of you that have already joined with us here or those that are sons. However, I think it'll help you reminisce on the journey you've been on and provoke more gratefulness, which is a win-win as well. So I want you to go with me to Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28, very familiar story. One of the reasons I so enjoy speaking to leaders is, this, is the opposite reason I enjoy speaking to the younger generation. I love speaking to leaders because I don't have to familiarize you with anything. I love speaking to the younger generation because I don't have to unfamiliarize them with anything. So with you, I've got to get you to deconstruct some preconceived ideas. I feel called to do that. With them, I'm helping frame culture not inside of those same preconceived ideas. And so these are kind of our goalposts for the homestead, leaders and the next generation. You'll probably, if you look deeply at anything we're doing, anything we're investing in, anything we're giving resources and energy toward, it's generally doing that. We're raising up sons that are designed to be leaders in the earth, and we are pouring into the next generation to create a culture of people who do not know what it means to be captive to the spirit of religion. And I don't, I, I have spent so many of my years trying to lead within the religious system. I've found great joy and, fu and fulfillment in turning toward a generation. The Bible said there was a generation born in the wilderness that did not know Egypt. And I don't want to teach them Egypt if they don't know Egypt. I want them to know milk and honey from the day they're, they're conceived in their mother's womb. And us begin to train and teach them how to more effectively be who it is they were designed to be. So I don't necessarily differentiate the young generation from leaders. I know when I speak to them, I am speaking to leaders. I'm not even talking about up and coming leaders. The people who probably have the most impact on our culture of worship here it would be the younger generation. And their heart and passion, not just to go after God, but to open their hearts to 
encounters that really help become a compass for us as to how we're going to do life around here. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a few verses in just a moment in Acts 27, and then the bulk of what we'll do be Acts 28, 1 through 10. But before I get in, into that, what I'd like to do is I would like to give you a little overview of chapter 27. Chapter 27 is often overlooked, and that's the text that leads up to the shipwreck where Paul ends up on Malta, bitten by the serpent, shakes off the serpent, the whole story that most of us are familiar with. 27 gets overlooked because there's a lot of nuances in there as to how Paul got there, but I think it's very relevant for leaders. And I'm going to give a title to this. I don't normally do that. When you see a title on on a YouTube or something, I guess Ty came up with it because I don't ever give, or Lauren, is Lauren who comes up, it'll be better if Lauren comes up with it. She's a content creator and I could always use one of those, whatever that is. So, so I, uh, so I want to give you a little background on chapter 27 leading into 28, but the title I'm going to give tonight is the perils of being driven by the wrong wind. The perils of being driven by the wrong wind. The truth of the matter is the kingdom man should never know what it's like to be driven toward anything. Slaves are driven. Sons are led. Say again. Slaves are driven and we live in a culture that applauds people who are driven. The problem is being driven is a witness of still being in captivity. But being led is a witness that you've moved into the arena of sonship that you were designed for. The, the, one of those is much easier to do initially, and that is be driven. You don't have to know where you're going. You don't have to hear from God. You don't have to, you're just driven. You're just, this is the assignment. We're just going to get the assignment done. The problem is if you follow the trajectory of a driven individual, you'll find them end up in exhaustion. You'll, they'll end up in, again, a slavery to futility. They'll end up being robbed of much of the joy and peace they were designed to walk in. Because you and I as sons were not designed to be driven by a cause. We were designed to be led by the Spirit. And so again, we're going to talk tonight about the perils of being driven by the wrong wind. And I'm going to give a secondary title here, which I never do, but I think it's important tonight. And that title is this, the breath in your face becoming the wind at your back. The breath in your face becoming the wind at your back. Holy Spirit, help us tonight to yield to you unveiling Jesus for us. I'm not content to know as I have known, but I want to know as I have been known. Therefore, we yield to the unveiling to see what we've not seen before. We give you permission to provoke. We give you permission to strip. We give you permission to shake. We give you permission to deconstruct. So that we may come on the other side of this with an authentic trust in the greatness of our God to watch over his word to perform it. In the awesome name of Yeshua. Can you say yes? yes. Well, I feel this already. I was again walking on the beach. I was walking on the beach. And when I did, for those of you that hang out on our beach, um, we don't have a bougie beach like Mark and Eva have a bougie beach they hang out with. They used to not, though. They earned it because they grew up in Panama City, and ain't nothing bougie about Panama City Beach. But, but if you go a little bit west, you uh, find out where Jesus and the 12 disciples set up the New Jerusalem right there. Um, and I, uh, I was walking on our beach, and we have a giant pirate ship. Can't help me, Orange Beachers, Gulf Shores. We have a giant pirate ship that goes up and down the coast, and shoots off cannons. And you'll know that the pirate ship is out because you'll be, you know, walk, minding your own business and your PTSD will kick in. You start to hear cannon fodder go off on Orange Beach and you see all the people with the pirate outfits on and realize people really do go on vacation and do this crap. If y'all would quit doing that crap, I wouldn't have that cannon going off every time I'm walking up and down the beach. You're the mini golf problem, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so the, the, the pirate ship is going by, and I'm watching the pirate ship, and I don't know how tall the mast is on this thing, but it's unbelievable. And it's all center mast, and I mean, it's just, this is a sailing machine, but there's one problem. There's four motors pushing the pirate ship, right? 
Because we don't want to sail, we want to look like we're sailing. And we don't want to depend on the wind. We want to look like a wind vessel. When actually what we've done is put mechanical things in place because we want progress that is not dependent upon the wind. And the truth of the matter is for the man and woman of the kingdom that have given themselves to this lifestyle, this was only really designed to work by wind. They so believed that that they locked themselves in a room and prayed for 10 days. They had the gospel. They had the declaration of who Yeshua was. They had the promise that he would be resurrected and the fact that they had touched his resurrected hands and they did not come out of that room until they got wind. Because they understood that having the right information without having the necessary wind is not going to produce the hope for results. Again, they knew who Jesus was. They believed who Jesus was. They had witnessed the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, but they knew, do not come out of this room until we get the promise. Go to Jerusalem and tarry until you be endued with power from on high. And I think much of what we're doing in the church currently could very well be being done without any wind whatsoever. We've learned how to crank the motors. We've learned how to mechanically move from one place to another place, but I'm afraid our cannon fodder is little more than noise. Having little impact on the culture, sure looking like we're a church, sure having all the trappings of a church, singing fast and slow songs and preaching sermons like we're a church, but not operating in the wind that we were designed to operate in so that we could have the impact on the culture that we were designed for. And I think we've become a shell of the wind-driven family that we were designed to be in the earth. And the Father is raising up people. I'm not, I do not say this from a, from a critical spirit, but from the hope of what I see emerging. And the hope of what I see emerging is not a little bit better than the tragedy of what the church has become. This is going to be a whole different ship altogether. So as we dive a little bit into Acts 27, I'm going to give you a hint of an overview of kind of what happens here. This is, this is, this is kind of what this looks like. And, and again, I've preached this text. Some of you have been tortured by hearing me preach this. Uh, no telling how many times. But this is not that. And what I am learning what I'm learning is that a point of view has more to do with a point than a view. Salah. A viewpoint or a point of view is a view from a point. And if your view hasn't changed, it probably means your point hasn't. Therefore, you should be in an ever-evolving view based upon the fact that you're in an ever-evolving change of the point you're at. This is the problem with people who can't change. They want to double down on the familiar and hope that they're going to get a different measure of breakthrough. And it doesn't happen that way. You've got to change your point, and if you'll change your point, you will naturally change your view of things. All right, so... An overview of verse 27 for me from a different viewpoint looks like this. Paul finishes his defense, and, and more accurately, his declaration of the gospel of the resurrected Christ to King Agrippa. That's chapter 26. Chapter 26 is this phenomenal Paul laying out his understanding and revelation of the gospel to King Agrippa. It's being used as a defense, but more as an announcement of the good news of the gospel. So in chapter 27, we find Festus handing Paul and a number of other prisoners over to a Roman officer by the name of Julius. Now, he's put on a corn ship. It's what's called a corn ship. Would have been about 275 feet long, huge ship, but it's a cargo ship. But they're using a cargo ship to now transport a few prisoners. Hold on to that thought. We'll get back there. A cargo ship to transport a few prisoners. So Festus again hands Paul, and the Bible doesn't say how many. It just says a number of other prisoners over to Julius. Puts them on this cargo ship. The cargo ship is planning on making stops at various different ports all along the southern coast of Turkey. Ultimately, they're going to sail all the way to Italy, and from the coast of Italy, Paul's going to take his journey to Rome, where God has predestined him to stand before Caesar, all right? So they start out, 
But they make little headway because for several days, the Bible said they're dealing with a contrary wind. The, now, here's the fascinating thing. The wind being against you is actually how you sail. You know that wind beneath my wings story? You're going to crash. Because that's not how aviation works. You actually need wind over your wings to be able to, hello, to be able to create lift. All right. So, sorry, Bet. I hate that song anyway, to be honest with you. That's the most chick song I've ever heard in my life. Bet, I'm sorry, Bet. That's Bet Mittler for y'all that don't know her by first name. I just throw that out from I'm sorry, Bet. So, 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 so here's what you need to understand. The winds are contrary. In essence, what that means is the wind is trying to dictate another direction, and they are determined to go in the direction that they want to go in, regardless of what the wind is trying to dictate. And we have a bad definition of success which has birthed a bad understanding of the direction we need to be moving in. And nobody feels like they're successful unless they have metrics to prove they're successful and the wind may not be blowing you that way. But if large means success, if more now than before means success, and no matter if we're talking about money, if we're talking about people, if we're talking about stuff you can count, you have the wrong metric. If you can count it, it's the wrong metric for success. If you can weigh it, you might be on the right course. Glory can be weighed. People and money can be counted. And you and I should be measuring success based upon the fact that the wind of the Spirit is leading us into a greater understanding of how to handle the weight of the glory that we were designed for. To, to, to settle for anything less is to molest the biblical definition of success. So what do you do when the wind doesn't go where you want the wind to go? You fight, you labor, you tire, you lead miserably. Look, it's how it getting quiet. Like, then I guess, I guess we don't have any leaders in here. <laughs> right? I, that's, that's when I know y'all snuck in. You want to be leaders. Because you know tired and you know exhausted and you know frustrated. You know these people are never going to get it. And it don't matter how many times I stand up here and say this until I'm blue in the face. These people are not going to get honor. If I preach on honor for the next three years, these people are not going to get honor. Because they just don't, they're just not going to get it. And, just, and what we may be doing is we may be missing the reality that that's not even the direction the wind's trying to take us. That's just direction we want to go because we want to be able to count things in an inferior metric of success. This can help some people if you can get it. But if success is about where you are in union instead of where they are in growth, then you recognize that my increase in union will manifest an increase in their union, and that's what leadership should look like. It shouldn't necessarily mean there's more of them. It may mean there's more glory moving within the handful that we have. I don't, I don't, I don't say that as to uh, excuse not making progress. I say that to make sure you don't have a bad definition of progress. Because some are just lazy and will use that as a cop-out to be able to say, well, we ain't growing and nothing's happening, but my God, you know, we're, we've got the glory in this. No, you may not. Because glory is evidenced. There's a witness of having had the glory. And if you have it in a handful, trust me, it won't stay a handful because there are too many places where there's no glory. If you begin to operate in the glory, you will begin to see increase. But there may be a season where you don't get to go the direction you want to go because that's not the direction the Spirit is taking you. So the winds were contrary. Because the winds were contrary, they set out anyway. They tried to take a voyage anyway. And a voyage that should have taken them uh, uh, days takes them weeks. And one that takes them weeks takes them months. But they're hell-bent and determined to take the trip. And I have found out some things about the Lord. He'll let you make the trip. He will let you waste your energy. Because sometimes that's the only way to get us desperate and sensitive enough to surrender. Therefore, you getting exhausted may be love. 
Therefore, you giving yourself to a system that didn't have the ability to move you into the deeper things of God may have been the love of God so that you could know that is a waste of my time and energy. I want to give my life to something that's actually going to have an impact in the earth. Can anybody say yes? So the, 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 the ship is planning on making various stops along the coast of southern Turkey, and they start to make a little headway for several days, but it's a very little headway because of the contrary winds. They finally struggle into a cove in Lycia, and the Bible says they remain there for a long time. doesn't say how specified it is, but finally the winds got bad enough they couldn't keep just struggling and limping along, so they found their way into a, into a port in Lycia. Interestingly, the port was called Fairhaven. And in the port of Fairhaven in Lycia, Paul addresses the sailors and the crew and tells them, we do not need to take this trip. Okay? So what we now have is we now have an apostolic decree being sent to a group of people who are professional sailors. And we've got the tension of the sailors knowing when they should and should not sail and the apostolic authority knowing this is a season when you need to listen to me even if you think you're an expert in this area. And it's hard to get experts to align with authority. Because most times there's not enough humility there for, it to admit, for them to admit that you may have a perspective they do not. So Paul tells them, says, this is what's going to happen. He said, if we leave here, we're going to lose this ship and quite possibly lose our lives. And the captain and the owner of the ship were persuaded more by the sailors than they were by Paul. What's the picture here? It's a picture of leaders who are more persuaded by the people than they are persuaded by apostolic authority as to what this season should look like. It becomes leaders who spend their whole life looking for direction from the people to tell them what they think the church should look like. And the reason why we have this joke of a pirate ship with four motors is because we let the people tell us what the church should look like instead of apostolic authority teaching us what the church should look like. Because what the people want, shorter services. What do the people want? I want four services to be able to pick from. What do the people want? I want a conversational message. I want a comfortable chair. And what are we designed to do? Equip the saints for the work of the ministry until we all come into the knowledge of a perfect man after the pattern of the Lord Jesus. And people don't want to be equipped. People want to be entertained. But hear me, friend. People don't want to be equipped. People want to be entertained. People want to see a really good show. Good singing, good musicians, eloquent, articulate, well-dressed hipster preachers. God, hell, I wouldn't go to a church with a hipster preacher if you put a gun to my head. Roll your pants down, man. Come on. No, because this is what we want. We want th we're looking for something that appeals to us on the sensory level. And that's appealing to me on a sensory level. That, 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 may, may, I like to say that I go to church there. And I like that nothing is required of me. I've had people say things like this. I like going to this church they never talk about money. Mm. That's challenging if you're using the Bible, which has quite a bit to say about money. Most of Jesus' parables have something to say about money. Right? <laughs> I, I like this because they, there, there's, no, there's never any demand placed upon me. And the problem is it's impossible to equip a group of people that you're not demanding that they move into something greater than they're operating in right now. That's part of what the equipping process looks like. All right? So what we have here now is we have Paul saying, man, I'm telling you, don't take this trip. And rather than listening to the apostolic authority they chained the apostolic authority and now you've got a ship with a chained up apostolic expression who could keep you in a place of safety and provision but because you've decided to listen to the people you have then 
advertently or inadvertently chained up the apostolic expression. Let's look at verse 13 through 15 of Acts 27. I should be beyond page one by now, but we'll get there. Acts 27, 13 says, when a gentle south breeze began to blow, they assumed they could make it. Now, this is in direct contradiction to what Paul told them they needed to do. If you back up a little bit, you can find here in verse 9 uh, that Paul advised the frightened sailors that they should not put out to the sea in such dangerous weather, saying, men, I can see that our voyage would be disastrous for us to bring, uh, and bring great loss, not only to our ship and cargo, but also to our own lives. We should remain here. Then you get down to verse 13. When a gentle south breeze began to blow, they assumed they could make it. So they pulled up anchor and and sailed close to Crete. But it wasn't long before the weather abruptly worsened and a storm of hurricane force called a nor'easter tore across the island and blew them out to sea. Let's look at verse 15. And blew us out to sea. The sailors weren't able to turn the ship into the wind, so they gave up and let it be driven by the gale winds, the perils of being driven by the wrong wind. The perils of being driven by... By the wrong wind. Paul advises the sailors not to set sail. He says the ship will be lost, possibly their own lives. But the officer was persuaded more. Listen to this. The officer was more persuaded by the people, the ship's captain, the ship's owner, than he was persuaded by Paul. Now, now, now we can... Uh, We can see that Paul has an encounter with an angel and and is promised three things. And then we're going to go into Acts 28. Paul has an encounter with the angel of the Lord and he's promised three things. Number one, only the ship will be lost. Number two, you are destined to stand before Caesar. And number three, because of the favor on your life, not only you will be spared, but everybody that sells with you will be spared. So the apostolic expression has kept us alive even though he's chained up. But we were meant to do more than stay alive. Amen? Now, I'm on, we go, we take a, now, a lot of people don't want to talk about the apostolic right now, and they create this, uh, this homemade doctrine that that season's over. We will know when the apostolic season is over when the church is a perfect man. Until then, the prophetic season is still on. The apostolic season is still on. The evangelistic. I know that you don't want authority, so you'd love to say we're in an age of, you know, an oracle age or whatever we're at. And there are oracles, yes, but it doesn't replace anything. Those gifts are to be equipping gifts until we come to the fullness of a complete mature man made after the pattern of Christ. So we're not going to be afraid of biblical terminology because it doesn't fit in our culture where we put motors on our pirate ships. Felt good to say. I don't know how good it felt to hear. It's not that part's on you. All right. Now, I'm going to read verse 39 through the end of chapter 27, and then we'll read the first 10 verses of chapter 28. So beginning in chapter 39, when daylight came, the sailors didn't recognize the land, but they noticed a cove with a sandy beach. So they decided to run the ship ashore. They cut away the anchors, leaving them in the sea, untied the ropes holding the rudders, and hoisted the foresail to the breeze to head for the beach. But they drifted onto the rocky shoals between two depths of the sea, causing the ship to flounder, still a distance from shore. The bow was stuck fast, jammed on the rocks, while the stern was being smashed by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers wanted to kill all the prisoners to prevent them from escaping, but the Roman officers were determined to bring Paul safely through, so he foiled their attempts. I'm sorry, not Roman officers, Roman officer, verse 43. But the Roman officer was determined to bring Paul safely through, so he foiled their attempts. He commanded the prisoners and crew who could swim to jump overboard and swim him ashore. The rest all managed to survive by clinging to planks and broken pieces of the ship so that everyone scrambled to the shore uninjured. Paul's word was actually not a hair of their head will be harmed. Verse 1 of chapter 28, 
big. After we had safely reached land, we discovered that the island we were on was called Malta. Your Bible may say Melita. The people who lived there showed us extraordinary kindness for they welcomed us around the fire they had built because it was cold and rainy. When Paul had gathered an armful of brushwood and was setting it on the fire, a venomous snake was driven out by the heat and latched onto Paul's hand with its fangs. Let's read that again. A venomous snake was driven out by the heat, say by the heat, and latched onto Paul's hand with its fangs. When the islanders saw the snake dangling from Paul's hand, they said to one another, no doubt about it, this guy is a murderer. Even though he escaped death at the sea, justice has now caught up with him. King James says, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth him not to live. Vengeance suffereth him not to live. This is important. woo Paul shook the snake off, flung it into the fire, and suffered no harm at all. Everyone watched him, expecting him to swell up or suddenly drop dead. After observing him for a long time and seeing that nothing unusual happened, they changed their minds and said, he must be a god. (laughs) Can you say people are fickle? He's a murderer one minute, and he's a god the next minute. You'd be amazed what could happen if you just learned to shake some things off. What you've hung on to, because it's your excuse for your dysfunction, the attack you went through and how people did you wrong and how somebody hurt your feelings and how your mama didn't nurse you or how your apostle didn't nurse you might be more relevant. And people hang on to the snake and then they're hanging on, they go, and the reason they don't shake it off is because then you might be expected to operate as if things that should have an impact on you don't have an impact on you at all. And if you lose the excuse of having been attacked, you might have to start being functional. I say, I come from a dysfunctional family. I, I'm trying to find a functional one. Everybody's got a reason. Everybody's got an excuse. Everybody's got a story. Everybody has had venom thrown at them. But some people learn to receive grace to just say, this is not going to define me. I'm not going to spend the rest of my life pointing to these scars and pointing to these wounds. Everybody's got scars. Everybody's got wounds. I'm going to get obsessed with the scars and wounds of Jesus himself. And I'm going to shake this off. And the transformation took place as a consequence of them witnessing what the attack should have done to him, but was unable to. Influence is inherited on the other side of how it should have turned out and you refusing. That's where influence is inherited. He goes from a murderer to a God with one shake. Uh, And back in my day, I would preach this part right here. Oh, I would get a handheld microphone, a, a B3 Hammond organ, and make people nervous up in here. All right. I have been delivered, praise be to God. All right. So let's go a little bit further. Let's go a little bit further. So he shakes off the attack, right? He flings it into the fire and suffers no harm at all. Everyone watching him expecting him to swell or suddenly drop down. After observing him for a long time and seeing that nothing unusual happened, they changed their minds and said he must be a god. The Roman governor of the island named Publius had his estate nearby. He graciously welcomed us as his house guests and showed us hospitality for three days. The, for the three days that we stayed with him. His father lay sick in a bed, suffering from fits of a high fever and dysentery. Now, if you're reading uh, King James Bible, it says bloody flux. I don't know what that is, but it sounds horrible. So, so I'm glad they changed that to dysentery because a bloody flux sounds like something you do not want to have. <laughs> so Paul went into his room, and after praying, he placed his hands on him. He was instantly healed when the people of the island heard about this miracle. They brought all the sick to Paul, and they were also healed. The islanders honored us great, greatly, and when we were preparing to set sail again, they gave us all the supplies that we needed for our journey. The perils of being driven by the wrong wind. The breath in your face becoming the wind at your back. Why don't you look at one more verse? I wasn't going to do this, but I think I will. Let's look at chapter 27, verse 17. Thank you, Scarlet. So the crew hoisted the dinghy aboard. The sailors used ropes and cables to undergird the ship. 
How much energy are they expending trying to keep a ship together when the Lord already spoke to Paul and said the ship is going to be lost? How much energy do we spend trying to hold something together that God's idea is for the thing to fall apart so that you can find your way to Malta? Do you know what Malta means? Honey. I'm trying to bring you into the sweet spot and you're spending all of your energy trying to hold on to a boat, convinced that the boat is the way that you're going to get there. And it does not matter how you get there. This is where it gets fun. Are you ready? Okay. So how much energy have we wasted trying to hold something together? An effort and energy that we're really expending as a result of a lack of trusting, assuredly trusting that Abba will do all that he's promised. How much energy are we expending trying to hold something together because we have pre-envisioned how we're gonna get there? The promise is you're gonna stand before Caesar. The promise is you and all of the men that you sail with are gonna be protected and not a hair of their head will be lost. You know what they're doing? They're frantically trying to save the ship. You know what was also the promise? The ship is not gonna make it. I came tonight to prophesy to you, you can spend the rest of your life trying to keep your ship together or you can let fall apart what was never God's idea to begin with and you can find yourself living in a place called honey. I think one of the greatest challenges to peace in the life of people is an unwillingness to trust when things are falling apart. How do you even undergird a ship? I begin to think about weird stuff today. How you get a rope in a hurricane up under a boat? Does one of these Leroy's got to jump in and swim to the other side in a hurricane, bring the rope? How do you do? How? I mean, we live in a nautical world here. I have no idea how you run a rope up under a boat in a hurricane, get it to come up on the other side, but it doesn't matter because you've tried harder to try to hold your stuff together. How many people have you chased around? Because if they leave and take that tithe check with them, I don't know. And oh my God, they weren't here two weeks in a row and you got sweat pouring down your head, driving home and have created a whole artificial conversation in your mind about what you would like to say to them. And how about how, oh, I bet what it was was two Wednesday nights ago I said something, I saw a look on their face, I bet they're offended. At... Y'all so quiet. <laughs> I'm gonna come to y'all's church and be this quiet when you're doing something. Right now, seriously, like how much energy have we expended going, oh God, the boat. Oh God, the payment. Oh God, they're, if they leave too, and you know, they're connected to them, and I bet they already talked to them. And if they talk to them, and there's a group of them, and somebody told me they're hanging out with them, and all of a sudden you created a family tree of, wow, this thing's going to look when all these people run off and leave you, and you could be going, he said what he said. And I hope they're there when we get there, but my promise wasn't contingent on them. I'm, I'm going to try to help some people tonight. I hope, I really do. I have a compassionate heart at the core of who I am, and I hope everybody stays with me. Why would you want to leave me, you know? And so I hope everybody stays with me, but I'm moving into the fullness of what the Father has designed for me, and I am done wasting my energy trying to make sure everybody else is on board. They throw the tackle over. Go back and read chapter 27. They throw the rigging over. They throw the tackle over. Watch this. Then they start throwing the cargo over. You're, not a, you're a cargo ship. You just lost the purpose for which you existed. Why? We lost the weight of what we were supposed to carry because we've been so concerned with people. And we threw miracles over because that's not what everybody wanted. And we threw speaking in tongues over because that's not what everybody wanted. And we threw dancing over because that's not what everybody wanted. And we don't ever lay hands on people anymore because that's not what everybody wanted. And I did not get in this thing to do what everybody wanted. I am not a politician. I'm a vessel sent by Father God into the earth to make the decree. Jesus is Lord and nobody else is. And when we do that, we'll lose some stuff off the boat. Sometimes you just throw Jonah overboard. Mm. How much energy have we wasted trying to hold something together, 
expended effort and energy that we did not have as a result of a lack of trusting and the assurance that Abba would do exactly as he has promised. Even if not by the means we pre-envisioned. He never told them to figure out how to take the land. To send the spies was unbelief. Because his whole idea was walk around this place. But they are carrying a pre-envisioned military paradigm. One for which they are ill-equipped into a situation. He's going to try to give it to them just by their walk. A walk and a shout. And I'll give you the whole thing. Oh, I could say something right there. A walk and a shout. The boat is only indispensable in the natural. We are limited by our obsession with the inferior sensory realm. Therefore, we can't imagine abandoning the boat and its artificial sense of security. Oftentimes, we find ourselves trying to undergird and reinforce the, reinforce the very thing that holds both ourselves as well as the apostolic expression of the gospel of Jesus captive. Trying to hold together something that's holding you captive. Because you can't pre-envision him fulfilling his word over your life without this boat holding together. This is what the Lord said to me, do on the beach is what I'm doing. Amen? For me, the ship over the last 15 or so years has come to represent the religious system. And although that representation is still vibrant in my heart, I'm beginning to see things even more clearly from my point of view right now that I have in the past. What if the gospel ship we are leaving behind is not just the religious system, but actually an inferior expression of the gospel itself? Because what we're receiving right now is not a new pattern for how to build a church. What we're receiving right now is an apostolic decree of the authentic gospel. And that is enabling the Lord to build the church. And unless he builds it, we labor in vain that build it. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I am not here to build this church. I am here to declare to you that the Father is exactly like Jesus and the Lord, the Holy Spirit is unveiling Jesus to us. And if we can roll out the red carpet and host Holy Spirit well, we'll never have to waste another drop of sweat trying to get people to pick our church over somebody else's church. I don't live in that paradigm ever. Watch it. I'm going to read this again. Thank you, Lord. For me, the ship of the last 15 or so years has come to represent the religious system. And although that representation is still vibrant in my heart, I talked about denominations when I talked about this and talked about even these, these, these ridiculous apostolic networks that people uh, get, become a part of when they have no real relationship, no real accountability, no real insight into what life looks like. And that representation is still vibrant in my heart. But from my new viewpoint or point of view, I'm beginning to see things even more clearly than I have in the past. What if it's a gospel ship we are leaving behind. An inferior expression of the gospel that has held us prisoner and failed to honor the intended apostolic expression of the church. Let me read that part again because y'all didn't get loud on that one at all. An inferior expression of the gospel that has held us prisoner and failed to honor the intended apostolic expression of the church that is an announcement of the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's what the apostolic is for, to say it is finished. And this is what life is supposed to look like on the other side of this. This is interesting. I want you to, I want you to hear this. Whew. A gospel that has held us prisoner and failed to honor the intended apostolic expression and a subsequent government of that expression, watch this, and then we've wondered where is the fruit of the early church? 
Maybe that expression is chained up in our gospel ship. Now, I'm going to be very careful with what I'm about to do. This is what the Lord told me to do on the beach. And I'm going to be very careful because I really want to honor the three people who wrote this terrible song. Because they're good heart. They wrote, listen, I preach some terrible sermons with a really good heart. So I can honor people that wrote some terrible songs with a really right heart. And two of these people I've known personally, Vestal Goodman and Bill Gaither. The other one is Russ Taff. I wish I had known Russ Taff personally. Russ Taff and I have something in common. Brennan Manning changed our lives. Yeah. Russ Taff and I have that in common. So Russ Taff, how Russ Taff started writing songs with Bill Gaither and Vestal Goodman, I don't know. But, you know, whatever. Here's the lyrics to a song called The Good Old Gospel Ship. Uh, Taylor will not need me to read these words. <laughs> I have good news to bring. And this is why I sing. All my joys with you I'd share. I'm going to take a trip in the good old gospel ship. I'm going to take a trip in the old gospel ship going far beyond the sky. I'm going to shout and sing until all heaven rings when I'm bidding this world goodbye. If you are ashamed of me, you have no cause to be. For with Christ I am an heir. Too much fault you find, you're sure to be left behind. While I go sailing through the air. It's really a mean song. <laughs> it's, it's really... Stick that in your ear, cowboy. That's really what they're saying in Hebrew. So, I'm going to take a trip in the old gospel ship going far beyond the sky. Hey, I'm going to shout and sing until all the heaven rings when I'm bidding this world goodbye. Oh, I can't hardly wait, and I know I'll not be late. I'm going to spend my time in prayer, and when my ship comes in, I'm going to leave this world of sin and go sailing through the air. There's so much wrong here, it's hard to even know where to start. I'm going to take a trip in the old gospel ship. I'm going far beyond the sky. I'm going to shout and sing till heaven rings when I'm bidding this world goodbye. When I'm bidding this world goodbye. When I'm bidding this world goodbye. I'm going to leave this life of sin. You're going to get left behind. I'm going to get in a ship and go through the sky. <laughs> Sucks for me. Sucks for you. Awesome for me. God bless you. Thank y'all for coming. And I, and, and I say it again, I want to I be cautious here because if you want to go back and listen to some of my old sermons, they are way worse than that song. <laughs> but I, what I do want to say to you is you and I are being asked to quit trying to hold together something that cannot get us where we're called to go. And when you have so much trust that you don't have to fight to try to keep everything together, but you shout even when it looks like everything's falling apart. Why? Because you have a promise that is not contingent upon any particular means of transportation to get you into the fullness of the promise of God. The promise all by itself is enough for you to get stirred in your heart toward thanksgiving because you know, you know what? I didn't say, God, I'll go as long as you make sure the ship's okay. And, and we, ha we are going to have, I want to say this very distinctly tonight, we are going to have to let a gospel that cannot stand storms fall apart so the Holy Spirit can teach us how to travel by way of the wind. We cannot afford any longer to have a gospel that fights against grace. You did not get to grace by believing. You got to believing by grace. We cannot afford to have a gospel that when the declaration of the finished work of Jesus is presented, there's an asterisk. Asterisk beside it and says, oh yeah, and in, the rest of it will be up to you. No, man. He who has begun... A good work in you is faithful and just. He is able to keep that that has been committed to his hands. And what I feel jealous to do is rescue you from trying to hold it together. 
thinking it's your job to keep it from falling apart. I think on the other side of every miraculous kingdom breakthrough, there's a story of when somebody had to let it all fall apart. And there's a tension when you're letting it all fall apart because you feel like you've been irresponsible. You feel like you hadn't been faithful. You may feel like you don't even have what it takes. And maybe if I had been better, the marriage would have. And maybe if I'd been better, the business would have. And maybe if I'd been better, the church would have. Maybe if I'd been better, the children would have. And you spend all of your time trying to say, I've got to make this work. And there comes a point in time where you say, I will not put a motor on this sailboat. If we go nowhere, I'm going to depend on the wind. If it looks like I'm going backwards, I'm going to depend on the wind. If something I thought was going to take me 10 years takes me my entire life, I'm going to continue to depend on the wind. And I'm not going to step down into some mechanized thing that I'm constantly having to Your reason, there's one reason I don't own a boat. One reason. I can't fix crap. I, li- I had a house in a neighborhood with a boat slip. I got two boat slips at the beach. No boat has ever been in any of them. Because I can't fix stuff. Because what happens when you try to operate with a mechanized vessel, you better commit the rest of your life to fixing it. And some of you, all you do, all you do is tinker and call it leadership. All you do is patch things up and call it leadership. And you're being robbed from the life you were supposed to live where the only sound you hear is not the motor, it's the clanking of the rigging as the wind provides all the momentum that you need to enjoy what you were designed for. And there's something when you get that thing pitched up on its side and the wind is doing all the work. Some of you would just be happy to be in a motorboat. You're still using oars. You're still trying to row yourself to success. No wonder you're exhausted. This friend, this is not by might nor by power, but by my pneuma. Breath wind, says the Lord. And I, I, I know this can, even, this even can sound a little bit like a step back, but part of the responsibility on my life is to tell you something. And I want you to hear what I'm about to say. I am having more fun in ministry than I have ever had at any other time in my life. Far more important than that, I am having more fun in life than I have ever had at any other point in time in my life. And I'm going to say this to you. And I have never met a leader having as much fun with as much peace as I have in my life ever. And I've been around Christian leaders for years. I don't mean that as like a, oh, great. No, no, I'm telling you, I found a key. And I'm here to share the key with you. And the key is I don't spend my life making sure the boat's okay. I spend my life making sure the breath in my face is creating a wind at my back. Let's take it a step further. I want you happy. I mean, people who know me best know I endeavor as much as anything that the people around me be happy. I don't have slaves on my staff. Thank you, Lord. I don't want you to be driven by the wrong wind. I want you to be led by the Spirit because this thing is amazing. Now, now, if I need more people and more money, learn to row, buy a motor, and you spend the rest of your life being a mechanic. But if you want to know what joy unspeakable and full of glory feels like, Surrender to a measure of trust that says, I'm going to do this by way of the wind, even if it's been seasons where it looks like I'm making no progress, because I trust what he said. I trust what he said. The boat is dispensable. The word is not. I want you to let this hit you tonight by the grace of God. I read those lyrics to you. You can get those after the service if you'd like to. Or you can just talk to Taylor in the back. (laughs) 
if we could trust Abba and the beloved identity that we're learning and let go of what man has built under an inferior declaration and expression of the gospel, we could find Malta, honey. Honey is where Paul is able to release the apostolic expression and heal every sick person on the island. The boat is the place where he's not even able to tell them where we should or should not, when we should or should not sail. So maybe the falling apart is actually setting you free to be the apostolic leader. That you, when I say apostolic leader, I'm not calling you an apostle. I'm saying you understand you have been sent into the earth and you're gonna lead the way apostolic leadership led. And that wasn't just with great sermons, it was with signs and wonders and miracles and shakings and glory presence and supernatural transformation of cities with very small handfuls of people. So it was on honey where the apostolic expression is finally turned loose. This is the last part of this. I got that done in under an hour. I'm going to buy a lottery ticket. Oh, no, we're in Alabama. We can't have the lottery. We want our schools to suck. Okay. Thank, thank you, Baptist people. Y'all are awesome. All right. So we got to drive to Mississippi. Mississippi has better schools than Alabama. It's Mississippi. <laughs> it's after the boat is gone. It's after the boat is gone that Paul finds himself on honey, able to release the apostolic expression. Religion will always, and yes, I mean always, attempt to hold the apostolic expression captive. The result of this is to make the gospel about another set of rules versus the declaration of the finished work of Jesus. If I had to boil Paul's assignment down to one thing, it is the declaration that the old covenant has been done away with. A new covenant has come, and now you are no longer under the rules of the old covenant. You're under the spirit wind leadership of the new covenant. But that doesn't do us any good chained up over here. So you know what's happening? A gospel ship that has kept an apostolic expression captive is being torn apart. And on the other side of it, then we begin to move into the miracles. I'm going to say this to you. Don't think you get to keep preaching the same gospels and some prophet having told us miracles are about to show up at the church again. That's been being said my whole life and I'm almost 50. And miracles haven't shown up yet because we don't have an issue of miracles not being here. We have an issue of a wineskin that can't hold that wine right now. So we are in wineskin reformation and then we will naturally be in miracle inheritance. I'll give you a Bill Johnson quote right here because you shouldn't be allowed to have a leaders meeting without one. He said, it is illegal to ask for the fruit of the early church while honoring a book they did not have and ignoring a spirit they did. Thank you, Bill. Make your checks payable to Bill Johnson Ministries International. It's illegal. Listen to this quote. It's illegal to ask for the fruit of the early church while honoring a book they did not have and ignoring a spirit they did have. This idea that we're going to change the world because we get a lot of people to come to church and hear us talk is not changing the world. What's going to change the world is when a group of leaders learn to so radically trust God that they can depend on the leadership of the wind instead of being driven by the agenda of the people. That's what leadership's supposed to look like. And that's when it gets fun. That doesn't mean you don't care about people. It means you care so much about people that you're not going to cater to the stuff in them that actually needs to die. I'm not going to reinforce insecurities because it'll keep people running with me. It's not my responsibility. It's not my job. My job is to help establish you, not nurse you. See, a lot of times people need a spiritual father and they want to turn their spiritual father into a spiritual mother. Thank you, Lord. Reli I just moved on from that. So I did, that's called a segue. 
<laughs> Religion will always, and yes, I mean always, attempt to hold the apostolic expression captive. The result of this is making the gospel about another set of rules versus the declaration of the finished work of Yeshua. Leaders, hear me tonight. If you are tired of being a prisoner to trying to hold everything together, why not cut the anchors loose and dare to take the reckless, glorious journey towards honey instead of captivity? I'm going to read that again. Leaders, hear me tonight. If you are tired of being a prisoner to trying to hold everything together, why not cut the anchors loose and dare to take the reckless, glorious journey towards honey instead of captivity? I'm not only having the greatest time of my life, I'm having more fun than I ever thought you could have and do this. I heard somebody say one time, I, I, I probably was 22 years old, and I heard somebody say this about ministry. If you can do anything else, go do it. If you can't do that, then go ahead and surrender to the ministry. I wouldn't trade places with anybody on the planet. I'm serious. I say I trade cars and houses with some people, but there's nobody I'd trade lives with. Why? Because tonight I'm not standing up here being driven. And I'll be honest with you. Tonight I'm not going to go home and critique myself, see how well I did. I did that for so many years. I don't have social media, so I don't know who's giving me a thumbs up, a thumb down, or a middle finger up. I have no idea. I know which one there's probably more of. Because <laughs> I'm not naive. But that doesn't move me. I laid in this floor today and asked the Holy Spirit to envelop me. I went in my office, laid in the floor, asked the Holy Spirit to envelop me. I feel such a synergy with the Lord of the Holy, the Lord that is the Holy Spirit in this room. I know we're exactly where we're supposed to be. I'm not going to do everything right. I'm not going to handle everything right. I'm going to hurt some people's feelings. Some people are going to leave. Some people are not going to get enough attention. And some people are going to feel like some people are getting too much attention. I, I, don't, I don't deal with any of it. I go to the beach. Apostle Ball used to tell Apostle Aaron all the time, go play golf. I don't play golf. I go to the beach. If I could play golf like him, I'd play golf. But if you play golf like me, it's not relaxing. I don't want, I don't want the vacation to be a test of character. I cuss enough at church, I don't need to play golf. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. I'm going to close this. We're having this gathering tonight because I am called by Abba as well as jealous like Abba for you to know life and life more abundantly because that's what you were designed for. And if you're living life and life more abundantly, you know what you'll do? You'll lead well. You quit being so angry and frustrated and quit venting on people all the time and you'll actually have something of joy worth following, a marriage worth following kids worth patterning your life after this this is the dream we are living the dream i want to tell you something this is honey for me and don't think it was fun getting here and don't think there's not some shattered boats along the line but you can stand on your island of honey and say it was well worth it to just trust the word even when you didn't know if the boat could make it Maybe if we weren't wasting our energy trying so desperately to keep the boat together, we could start feeding the fire. Paul gets off the shipwreck. We don't know if he could swim or not. I don't know if Gamaliel taught him that. But he gets to the land, either by swimming or by broken pieces of the boat, and the natives there receive them, and they kindle a fire for them, and immediately... An apostolic expression that was chained up a minute ago who just came through hell and has a broken boat right behind him goes and says, the next thing I'm going to do is start feeding this fire. What if you weren't spending all of your energy worrying about that boat? Adjective boat. And you could just start feeding the fire. Remember the fire? 
one of the worst things that I've seen kill the firing leaders is not failure, it's success. Because then you become a boat manager when you're meant to be a fire builder. You become a boat mechanic when you're meant to be a fire builder. Paul reaches down, gathers a bundle of sticks, and here you have this apostolic leader of the church that is going to actually bring the gospel to the Gentiles and write almost two-thirds of the New Testament, yet he knows the most advantageous thing I can do right now is not cry over a boat. It is not try to find another boat. Wouldn't you, if you lost your boat and you had to go stand before Caesar, try to figure out how to find, I'm going to talk a little while tonight, try to figure out how to go find another boat, try to figure out a way to buy another boat, because your problem must be that you don't have a boat. And he said, I have a more immediate need than a boat, and that is to be warmed by the fire. And so I'm going to gather sticks, and I'm going to start spending the time that I should be spending looking for a boat. And everybody knows I need a boat, but I need a fire more than I need a boat. And I'm telling you, you need a fire more than you need a bigger building. You need a fire more than you need a new piece of property. You need a fire more than you need a new worship leader. You need a fire more than you need your people to give more. Is anybody hearing tonight? You need a fire more than you need anything else you think is missing. It's the fire that's missing. And Paul had the apostolic wisdom to feed the fire. Thank you, Lord. I gotta be honest with you tonight and tell you that once you abandon the, the system, the ship, your challenges don't magically end. When you hear the word of the Lord and move where God calls you, your challenges don't magically end. When the boat falls apart and you're not under the pressure of keeping the boat, the challenges don't magically end. Paul is gathering sticks, you know the story, to put sticks onto the fire and immediately here's the attack. I want to contend tonight, and I think this is important, that one of the chief honors and assignments of a true apostolic leader is to carry fuel for the fire. This is not a job for which you can afford to delegate. Intercessors are not there to pray for you. They're there to follow you into the deepest place of prayer. I contend that one of the chief honors and assignments of a true apostolic leader is to carry fuel for the fire. This is not a job for which you can afford to delegate while you spend your time and energy on easier and far less essential endeavors. Administration, organization. The idea that there is such a thing as an executive pastor is a problem. You may need executive leadership, but don't make them a pastor. Because they'll end up telling the apostolic expression what the church needs to do because they're in an executive position and you're a preacher and you need to stick to the Bible. I've seen it happen over and over again. You bring some guy in who knows how to do that and they say, preacher, you stay over there in your corner. And I'm telling you, I know what I'm designed to do on the earth and what I'm designed to do is fuel the fire, carry fuel to the fire, and from that receive the expression of the wind that tells the church the direction it should be going in, not hire somebody who understands business better than I do. And I understand business very well, but I'm not, not hiring that person because I understand it well. I'm hiring that, I'm not hiring that person because I'm not dependent on business to make this thing come to pass. I'm dependent on the fire and the wind. And friend, when the fire and the wind get together in the same place, you'll see something start to happen for which no business acumen could ever prepare the earth for. It's not executives that create wineskins. It's fathers. A little bit further. I've got a little bit more. Can you hang? I want to tend the fire of union and let the Holy Spirit unveil the face of Jesus. That's my assignment. That's what I come in here every day to do. I want to tend the fire of union and let the Holy Spirit unveil the eyes of Jesus. That's where the fire is. The eyes of Jesus. 
The fact is that in my experience, every time I, myself, or other leaders I walk with allow themselves to be fully given to the spirit assignment of carrying fuel for the fire, you will experience venomous attacks. You're welcome. But Paul's trying to teach you they don't have to have any impact on you whatsoever. Hallelujah. It's not that you don't get attacked. It's not that you don't face things. It's that the things that used to would have affected you one way don't affect you that way anymore. Because you've come through the storm and said, if he was faithful to me here, there's no way he's going to be unfaithful to me now. All right, let's get this last part. This is important. I could go on and on and on, but I don't want to keep you here all night. You will experience venomous attacks as we put the load that we have been carrying around into the flames. We will find that the venom that we have been carrying around can no longer be hidden. Put the load you've been carrying into the fire and you'll find out where the venom is. Venom is driven out by the heat. Look at verse three. When Paul had gathered the armful of brushwood and was setting it on the fire, a venomous snake snake was driven out by the heat. That's why most people avoid places of fire. And most leaders choose to lead without it. Sometimes this attack comes from the people we have carried in previous seasons. And when you submit them over to the fire... They didn't want to be tried by fire. They wanted to be carried by you. I should have said that earlier before you weren't so tired because that was really good. (laughs) The word venom is the word echidna. And it does mean a viper, but that's a very small part of the word's definition. Echidna means cunning, malignant, wicked men. Straight out of Strong's. Cunning, malignant, wicked men. When you go to take what you've been carrying and you put it on the fire, look out for cunning, malignant, wicked men. Poison that never manifested before the fires of revival will attack. And at this point, many leaders incorrectly surmise that the most prudent thing to do is turn back and begin to build according to the franchise model. Do not let an attack cause you to frantically attempt to patch up an old broken down ship that once held you captive. Now what? You've been shipwrecked, you got no boat, and now you've been bitten by a snake. My God, you're talking about a bad day. (laughs) And you're talking about how fast it became maybe Paul's best day. At least best day since a road called Damascus, where he is about to go from being captive and being shipwrecked and being attacked by venom to being so influential that the governor of the island brings him into his home and releases him to start releasing healing miracles all over the island, stays there for 90 days. And the thing you need to know about this story as we close, he did not go chained onto his next ship. Everything about the way Paul was perceived shifted when Paul refused to allow an attack to affect him the way it should have. You have a choice as to whether you allow that venom in your bloodstream. I'm going to talk a little while tonight. I got to help. I got to help some people to understand this. My, the, the people, the people, the people, the people, the people. Listen, this thing is not about me and people. I have apostolic leadership in my life that liberated me from the Levitical order and caused me to pick my head up from staring at the face of the people and turn my head to a Zadok priesthood where we stare face to face at Almighty God and as staring face to face at Almighty God, this thing becomes easy because when you get attacked, you say, well, it wasn't coming from him. 
and I live above a snake line where the enemy is allowed to do anything to me. Therefore, I am living in an arena where literally whether this thing affects me or not is based on two things. Will I shake it off? And will there be a fire to shake it into? He did not just shake off the attack. He shook off the attack into the fire, which assures him you will never have to deal with that venom again. When you've got a fire, you've always got a safe place to shake it off. Or you spend your life telling everybody what you went through. You get a bunch of leaders in the room and mo most of the time it's wine fest. Not that kind of wine, that would be better. <laughs> this kind. Oh, the people, oh, the people. It's not like that in our house. My kids are not, not, not afraid of ministry because they're seeing the party we're having. Like, why don't we want a life different than their life? Their life is the life you want to have. So they're up here all the time, going to Union University, trying to figure out how to get out of school early so they can go to Union University. I mean, they're just, he's, his office, Judah's office is now in my office. He's up here with me all day throughout the day today. Elijah's up here now. He's studying, doing real estate stuff, and he's studying up here, playing the guitar up here. And, and this, so there's not this thing where they're going, God, I hope I don't have to do that. They're going, this is the life. And I really feel like for leaders, this, this, is what, this is what the text says, and this is important. The text says after he's attacked, it says they watched him. And when he should have swollen up or fallen down dead suddenly, but he did not, they changed their minds about him and said he was a god. When you don't respond to the venom the way other people feel they're entitled and supposed to respond to the venom, you actually set yourself up for influence. Panic when you get attacked and you'll actually invigorate the venom. Shake it off into the fire and keep moving. And the venom will not have a vote as to what your future looks like. I feel this, man. Poison that never manifests before the fires of revival will attack. And at this point, many leaders incorrectly surmise that the most prudent thing to do is turn back and begin to build according to the franchise model. I say to you tonight, do not let an attack cause you to frantically attempt to patch up an old broken down ship that once held you captive. That said, for those who have authentically experienced and been supernaturally transformed by the fire, to lead any other way is no longer a viable option. The, re the reason leaders choose not to lead by fire is because they have not sufficiently been transformed by fire. Nothing would make me feel like more of a hypocrite than to try to lead this ministry without dependence upon the Holy Spirit. That has absolutely upended my world. Set me free first. S Let me say it like this. Set and setting me free first. That's the only way I know to lead. Let's go one step further. For those who have authentically experienced and been supernaturally transformed by the fire to lead to any other way is no longer a viable option. These leaders will manifest an incredible grace to simply shake off the venomous attack and feel no harm. At this point, supernatural influence begins to be inherited. Not based on your gift, but your commitment to Yeshua the one who has baptized you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I've been shipwrecked and I've been snake bit, but I've seen the fire in the eyes of Yeshua and I've felt the fire of the Holy Spirit and I will not and cannot settle for leading any other way. Are you with me? Paul was not in chains when he got on the next ship. First of all, you need to know that they didn't have a ship and they didn't have any supplies. And the people on the island, the King James said it like this, laden them with such things as were necessary to finish their journey. What do you need? We'll give it to you. 
Why? Because you're in the honey land. And from the sweet spot, you don't have to think about resources. They didn't have to get a job. They didn't have to come up with a plan. They didn't have to have a fundraiser. Capital stewardship campaign. They have to sell Krispy Kreme, <laughs> raffle off a shotgun, have a bake sale, and eat stuff out of people's nasty kitchen. That's a revelation. Paul's just feeding the fire. Refusing to mourn the boat and refusing to get stressed out that he doesn't have a plan to get another one. He's just feeding the fire. And I want to say this to you. The boat you need is in the fire you feed. The resources you need, they're in the fire you feed. The help you need is in the fire you feed. Whatever it is that you've thought, if I had this, I would, everything would be okay. It's not true. What's true is feed the fire and every resource you need gets unlocked by your unwillingness to stop feeding the flames. Ty, you want to jump up there, buddy? I want to say to you, I can think I can look at both the Old and the New Testament and find out that any time you're on the way to the land of honey, you'll have to walk through some snakes. Ask Israel. Before they could get into Canaan, they had to pass a land where people were being bitten by serpents. And they're dying left and right. Moses goes to the Lord and says, what do we do? People are dying from snake bites left and right. And he said, here's what you do. You take a pole and you take a brazen serpent and you wrap that brazen serpent around the pole and you plant that pole and when people who are bitten by the snake look to the inside of the serpent around the pole they'll immediately be healed if I be lifted up from the earth he who knew no sin became the serpent that I through him might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. And I'm telling you, we look to the boats and we look to the people and we look to the resources and we've forgotten how to look to the lamb. This is a little bit of my old school DNA coming out in this and I love it because I feel like the Lord is trying to help some leaders to say there's a more excellent way. I'm not in the boat business. I'm in the fire business. I'm not in the people business. I'm in the fire business. And I actually am surrounded by the gift of a group of people who would rather me tend the fire than be constantly taking care of people's needs because I believe everything's in the fire. How do you, how do you go from 120 people to the evangelism of the known world at the time in less than 10 years with 120 people. Spirit wind and cloven tongues of fire. A group of men who were not driven, but a group of men who were led. A group of women who were not driven, a group of women who were led. And from there, that 120 people gets announced as a group of people who have turned the world upside down. They didn't have a template for a church. The Old Testament does not talk about a church. Some have gone so far as to say a mystery hidden from the ages was the church. And all of a sudden, they don't know what a church is. And all of a sudden, he starts talking about this ecclesia and this koinonia. And they, they, don't, they don't know what he's talking about. The fire taught them how to do what they didn't know how to do. And the leadership of the wind of the Spirit taught them to do what they didn't know how to do. And all of a sudden, you got a group of people who've never thought about elders, but they're putting elders in place. And they've never thought about deacons, but they're putting deacons in place. And they've never thought about what the new rules should be. So they call a high council and bring everybody together and say, let's do this. Let's don't commit sexual immorality. Let's don't eat food that's been offered. I go for it. Y'all have a good time. Those are the rules. They don't know what they're doing, but they are surrendered. 
They don't know what they're doing, but they have experienced massive rejection. Come out on the other side convinced that Jesus is exactly who Jesus says that he is. I can say this definitively to you tonight. The storms I have experienced in my life have caused me to be increasingly more convinced than I ever would have been had I not gone through those storms. Therefore, I'm able to pronounce a benediction on an old gospel ship and find the gospel that I have discovered that was able to actually keep me through the storm. Because the gospel I inherited growing up when I went through my health crisis would have taught me to surrender and realize that I was on my way to heaven. But I was inheriting a new gospel that was teaching me that I had a decision to make as to whether I was going to shake this off or not. And I thank God for a fire to shake it into. It's not a boat you need. It's not a position on staff you need. Not a different building, not more people, not your people to have more money, not more tithers, not more, no, 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 no. The boat you need is in the fire you feed. And I want to bless you tonight. Not to waste another moment trying to undergird a ship that was destined to fall apart the moment it left the port. The promise is the boat will be lost. You will stand before Caesar and Paul because of the favor on your life. Not one hair of the head of the men you sail with will be lost. And I just feel such grace for absolute liberation in this room tonight from people who say, listen, Damon, and you guys can take this out of the way, please. And I, this is going to take some honesty. I don't, I don't care if, this, if you're a senior leader or you're a volunteer. If you're in this room tonight, you say, I am tired of trying to hold things together. I'm going to tell you, trust doesn't try to hold things together. Trust says, I have no idea how I'm going to get there without my boat, but I believe what he said. I thought the boat was going to get me there. I was dependent on the boat. It was a good boat, but I'm not a boat man I'm a fire man I feel this there's the glory of the Lord sweeping through here right now I just want to give an altar for people say I'm tired I'm tired of holding it together I'm tired of trying to do it by my energy I'm tired of trying to do it with my own resources I'm tired of trying to make everything turn out right Tonight I'm willing to say whatever needs to fall apart, I trust that I am headed toward a place called honey. And whatever that journey looks like, there's a yes in me. Come on. If that's you, I want you to get out of your seat. If you got to step over five people, do whatever you got to do. But I want you to get out of your seat and say, no, I am tired of trying to hold this together. And I'm going to trust that even if I lose the boat, the promise is still intact. Come on, come from wherever you are, all over the room. Come from all over the room. Get the rest of the team to go up, please. To get some of our leaders to begin to move through and pray for folks. You can listen, I'm jealous for you to start having more fun than you ever knew you could have. I'm jealous for you to have more joy than you ever knew you could have. I'm jealous for you to come out of the weight and the burden of believing you're the one that's got to hold everything together. tired come unto me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest cast your care upon me because I care for you take upon my yoke and my burden for it is easy and it is light is anybody tired is anybody thirsty Come on, won't you come? Won't you come? If you need the altar, I want you to come quickly. We're going to move into some worship together. Just let the refreshing winds begin to blow in the room tonight. Woo! Are you tired? Are you weary? Are you tired of watching the door to see who's going to come in and who's going to go out? I want you to be liberated from watching the door. And I want you
want you to see the eyes of fire.